All right, good morning, everybody. So spring has sprung in all of her glory. Good morning, everybody. It is the end of February. It is Phoenix, Arizona. And I wanted to make a video today because I haven't made one in a while. And I wanted to inform you guys of what I've been up to and a couple of the improvements that we've been doing here at the nursery and the time that I have not been making videos has been well spent on expanding the nursery. So we now have two locations. We have a third of an acre here, and we also have another two acre property that we have started filling with fruit trees so that we will eventually have that property to sell trees on someday. And it will also be a food forest. But I'm gonna give you a little pan around today to kind of show you the amount of trees that we have here and the quality of these trees. So what you're seeing here is just a small fraction, very small fraction of what we actually have now. We've really, really expanded the business and expanded the nursery over the couple, couple last years. Uh, the last two years, we pretty much sold every tree that we had. So we had to really expand and, out, and actually hide a few trees so that they would get a little bit larger in the interim so that we would have larger trees uh, for you guys for the public here for sale because I do like to specialize in a little bit of the larger specimen trees that are grown here and locally adapted. But the focus is not going to be on this today actually. I want to talk about one of the improvements that I have been doing over here on this property and also am working on on the other property and that is what we are going to be talking about today. So year round gardening, guys, imagine, imagine, imagine if you had a place in Arizona here where you could garden year round, okay? So it's either hot or cold here, guys. It's just, it, there's two seasons. Let's just call it two seasons. Uh, we don't have a very long spring and we don't have a very long fall. So how are we going to expand our growing season and also I needed a place to start to propagate more plants because like I said, I wanted to provide a lot of plants for not only here in the valley, but eventually I would like to expand to online sales and sending some of these beautiful high quality plants to definitely people in desert regions, but people all over the country, I think would benefit from having some very high quality fruit trees. So, like I said, we're not going to really focus on these today. We're going to be focusing on this bad boy. And this is the greenhouse that I put in over the winter time here so that I could have an area to go to where I could propagate my plants and enjoy being outside because it's so cold outside during the winter time. Likewise, it is very hot during the summertime. So, I needed a place where I could have plants and them stay a little bit cooler over the summertime. So let me see if I can back up here to kind of give you guys scale on this particular greenhouse or propagation house. So it is approximately, to kind of give you guys size, it is approximately 20 feet wide by 20 feet long and it is 12 feet tall at the peak and then it all then it tapers down to about 10 and a half feet towards the back of the house now placement obviously was a huge strategy as part of this greenhouse i wanted it in an area where it's going to get sunlight all year long i didn't want it shaded and i wanted to be able to control that myself so I wanted to be able to have full sun in the wintertime and I wanted to be able to have a shade up during the summertime so that I can start to cool down the greenhouse. Because obviously if you use any kind of a plastic or glass structure, you're going to end up superheating up that structure in the summertime. So I kind of want to go over a little bit of the construction of this greenhouse and I want to go over a little bit of the cost involved if it's something maybe you guys would like to do and I would also like to see if I can get some grants made to provide these greenhouses for folks here in the valley that might not be able to afford them 
Now, granted, this was not very expensive, and if you compare it to um, a pre-made greenhouse, it was really, really inexpensive, in my opinion. So the the total of the greenhouse build, the complete cost for the build was right around three thousand dollars and i will go over each part individually on that and i think it's very cheap for the amount of space that you have gained and also if you look at the pre-made greenhouses that are out there you don't very you don't get very much for the two or three thousand dollars you really have to spend a lot in order to get a good greenhouse you have to spend usually you know ten thousand dollars plus or have one custom made now, I am a fabricator by trade, welder fabricator, so this was a very easy project for me to slap together. And I will show you the construction, like I said, and maybe it's something that you could do for yourself. And know that it is basically in the space of a two-car garage. So it's basically, the if you want to know scale, it's about the size of a two-car garage because that's actually what this used to be. Now, when I got this property originally, obviously I didn't plan on doing, doing this amount of work and having the nursery and then having all these trees in the ground, but it's sort of shifted over time. And this is exactly what I want to do is propagate a lot more plants and get into mainly doing that because I'm really, really good at it. So let's just jump right into this and I'll go over a couple of different things for you. Um, kind of let you know what I've been doing. What I've been doing is I've been growing plants, guys. So I've got about 5,000 trees now that are ready to go for this year on this property and my other property. And that this has taken quite a bit of, of time and, and thinking because like I said, I've got two of these and I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted it to work exactly like I wanted it to work. And I didn't want it to be something that I just slapped up and then did not use in the future. So I put a lot of time and thought and energy and money to a certain degree into this build. And so let's just talk about it. All right. So it is at the back of the house. It is tucked in with two walls of the, using two walls of the house as the actual greenhouse. And I wanted some nice big access doors to get in and out, to move product in and out. So the first thing to address was the doors and the door size and the frame. So let's just go this way and we'll kind of take a look. All right, so let's go ahead and enter the greenhouse here and we'll just talk about a little bit of the construction first and then I will go over the temperature controls and water, of course, and what type of plants that I'm going to be keeping in this greenhouse. So what this is, is basically it's just a propagation station. So this is part of, um, I'm starting to grow everything here locally. Everything here, everything. Mangoes, star fruit, guavas, apples, peaches, you name it. I wanna grow everything here locally and I wanna start growing things from seed and then grafting on my own varieties so that they're adjusted to the weather. The biggest problem that I have found is getting stuff from other states. So a lot of the other nurseries will import things from Florida and California every year and those plants just do not do well in the long term. They may do good for the first couple of years but then eventually they start to decline because they were not adapted to the local environment. A good way to think about that is, you know, you take somebody that's been living in Alaska their whole life, they're used to that cold weather and then they come down here to Arizona where it's super, super hot and they can't deal with it. You know, they can't take off enough clothes. Whereas, you know, we're down here in Arizona, we're used to shorts. We'd go up to somewhere like Alaska or Wisconsin and we'd die. You know, it's just way too cold once it gets past about 75 degrees because we are acclimated to that environment. So that is the biggest goal. My number one goal on growing plants and trees in Arizona now is they have to be locally grown and adapted. I'm not going to bring in anything else. I'm tired of that business model. It doesn't really work really well because you have to sell all your plants and trees at the beginning of the year in spring when they look good. And then you more or less have to close shop for the summer because those, those plants start to burn up that came from somewhere else. 
So you definitely want things that are adjusted here to the climate as far as the heat goes and the humidity and the amount of sunlight that they get. So that is the purpose of having a propagation room so that I can start to harden off different plants. So they'll be started in the in here in this propagation room and then as they get larger and larger they will be sh slowly shifted out here into the yard where, where they will start to receive a lot more of this full sun and then they will be adapted so they don't burn so quickly. The worst thing that you could do is buy a plant that's been kept underneath a shade or in a in a greenhouse like this and then just put it straight outside in your yard right out in the full sun. It is not going to make it. Guys, I'm telling you. So you can't really shade the plants too much. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry to tell you that, but if you want long-term success, they got to get a little bit beaten up. So they can't be kept under shade cloths no matter where you go buy trees. If you go buy trees, look up and make sure there's no shade cloth above the plants. That way you'll know that that plant will actually make it in your yard. Okay. All right. So let's start it off. Let's get into this. So we've got some nice height here, guys. I wanted to, I wanted this to look nice and stately here at the back of my property. Uh, like I said, it's 12 feet tall. The doors are approximately 12 feet tall by 10 foot wide. And you would think that a door that large would be really hard to move. But the way that I designed these is they just move basically just by pushing, uh, pushing, pushing the door with your finger. So basically the weight is taken up by these caster wheels that are more or less welded to the bottom of the frame. So when you have such a large heavy door like this, you're not only gonna need some sort of hinge support, but you're gonna need something to take the weight as you're actually moving the door. So what's nice about this is you can just push this these huge doors with just your finger and they roll and open just so nicely. Move this rock out of the way so you can see here. So you can see that I'm just moving this with just a finger. So there's not a lot of weight on this because this has been, let me see if I can get up here. This has been bolted to hinges here at the top. Let me zoom in. So there's heavy duty hinges. There's two of them. One at the top, one at the bottom. And those are what is holding the weight of the door. So there is no, there's no friction when you go to open, open the door. Man, is it nice in here today? So you can see that I've got beams. I've got steel beams that I welded together to make the frame of the doors. Now you do need quite a few supports as you go through because the polycarbonate, which I will talk about here in a minute, it is a little bit flexible, but it is very, very tough. I mean, I, I see this lasting my entire lifetime and I don't see myself having to redo this. So I'm on the inside now looking up here at the door and you can see that there is a gap there at the top. Let me close that door. You can see there's a little bit of a gap there at the door and the reason the gap is there is so that these will open to the interior. So I wanted to be able to open up this greenhouse by pulling the doors in. So the doors swing right in and they rest right against the walls if you want it open. Like this time of year would be a nice time of year to open up the greenhouse. So you would swing these doors open and you would let all that air in to this area of your plants where you're growing. And then once it gets a little bit hotter during the summer, you can shut the doors and start to regulate the temperatures, okay? So as far as construction or pieces and parts that you will be needing, the way that I built this was basically, if you wanna think about it, it's a carport without the metal sheeting on the top. So instead of metal sheeting, I used this polycarbonate, polycarbonate sheeting. And what's really nice about this stuff is it's very, very, very tough. So this stuff, you cannot break it at all whatsoever. Uh, and it is crystal clear, but it has a UV coating on it, which allows the UV to be taken out of the equation. Now the UV is going to be the part that harms the plants. That's the part that will sunburn sunburn the actual plant. So you want to take the UV out of the equation. 
Plants like light. They like lots of light and they also like lots of heat. They grow the best during the summertime, but you have to remember that they dry out. So you need to keep the humidity in and the humidity is going to be kept in by obviously by watering and by keeping this, this area a little bit cooler. So I have this completely regulated now. <clears throat> so as far as the, the construction goes, you will need some, some metal beams. These happen to be uh, two inches by three inches wide and they fit together real well. I painted the door. I think it looks pretty nice. And like I said, I wanted something nice out here. I didn't want something that was just sort of slapped together or something that will blow away in the wind. This is very, very, very tough during the wind. So you're gonna need some metal. Um, I got most of the metal at Industrial Metal Supply here in Phoenix, Arizona. They've got the best prices on metal and metal beams. Then I also used what's called the C channels. And these C channels are what I use to reinforce any area of the greenhouse where there was a span that was say over six feet. So these can go, these can span about six feet without, without additional support as long as you're not standing on them. So for the walls, I could get by with less supports. I've got one, two, three supports on the sides. And then on the top, you can see that I have quite a few more supports because I wanted the spacing to be four feet between centers on the roof. That way I could lay a piece of plywood up on the beams if I needed to get on the, on the roof and do something on this plastic roof without falling through. And sturdy, guys, I'll tell you, we've had some pretty windy days lately and this thing absolutely has not budged at all. So the beams, the side beams there are six inch uh, C-channel beams, and then I'm using four inch uh, C-channel beams across the top. So that's a 20 foot span. And then the sides ended up being around 24 feet because they follow, they go down and they follow and they match the opposing pitch of the roof on this side. So there were several things to consider here. And one of them being cost of construction. So I figured by using this little spot here, I could use part of the house as some of the walls for the actual greenhouse. So I completely redid this, all of this siding. Uh, this is metal siding here. This has a coating on it that's good for 60 years. And so it is really good to have out here in the greenhouse where there's going to be humidity and moisture. You obviously wouldn't want that made out of any type of wood siding or something that's gonna get wet and rot. So that is one of the sides of the house actually right there. And then as we kind of turn the corner here, this is the, this is the other side of the house. So this is actually block, block over here on this side. So I just painted this real nice and put in some stained glass windows. I thought that would look pretty neat because this actually goes into a bedroom. So if I want to, I can open the window on this side and I can enjoy the coolness and the humidity coming from the plants that are outside. So basically two walls were a freebie. And then the other wall here is a door. And then the other wall here is the other support side. So that is the materials is the C purlins and the metal beams to support the actual structure to hold it up. In this case, there's six. There are six support beams that actually hold this up. Seven, actually, if you count that one. And then we've got the polycarbonate, and the polycarbonate comes in 12 foot long by two foot wide pieces. So I actually picked these up locally at Home Depot, believe it or not, they actually had something decent. And they've got these polycarbonate panels, they are $36 each. So if you add up the total cost of the polycarbonate, well, the roof alone is, there's 10 pieces in the front and 10 pieces in the back. So that's 20 pieces, that was around $720 just for the polycarbonate for the roof 
and probably right about the same for the polycarbonate on the sides and on the front. So that is the biggest cost involved is the polycarbonate, but it is also, like I said, this stuff is going to last forever. It's crystal clear. It's basically unbreakable material and it drills and machines really, really well. So you've got the cost of the polycarbonate, depending on how big it is, see that's gonna affect your cost now, obviously. And then the metal, we've got the metal, and then we've got the fasteners. And what I decided to do on this was use stainless steel fasteners on the outside. Let's see if I can focus on these. These are stainless steel fasteners. These are a, a bolt screw and then they have a little neoprene plastic washer underneath them so that when you drill holes through the polycarbonate, you can sink these screws in there without them breaking the acrylic or the polycarbonate. And they also um, seal it. So wherever you drilled that hole, once you put this the washer seal back on it, now you've sealed that hole back up from the elements and no water will leak into there. The other reason that I chose to do these uh, stainless steel fasteners is I didn't want any rust lines. So I didn't want this to eventually, you know, these be like a zinc plated bolt and the, these would rust someday and it would make these streaks, these ugly streaks down the plastic that I just put on. So I wanted to uh, figure out a way to make that not happen. So that's just by using stainless steel um, hardware to actually attach the panels. Now there's quite a few of them. I probably bought a bag of 500 and that did the whole, the whole entire greenhouse. So as far as your materials go, we've got your metal we've got your plastic and we've got your hardware also what i decided to do on these is i used some structural bolts and some angle iron to actually attach the overheads so i don't know if you guys can see that hopefully and you can see that they are attached via bolts so that is going absolutely nowhere there could be a hurricane and this thing's not going to go anywhere Okay, so let me see if that, that should cover all of the actual construction. Uh, we've got the metal, we've got plastic, we've got hardware. Um, and then one thing would be your shade. So let me include that because you're going to want to regulate your shade eventually in this, in this greenhouse because it's going to start to get hot as the full sun comes in. Now, what I decided to use was a white shade cloth versus a black shade cloth because a white shade cloth does not get as hot as under underneath it as a black one does. So this keeps the temperature extremely nice in here. Now the shade can be taken on and off and that's really nice for the winter time because you can take it off, let all that winter sun in and then you can put it up over the summer. Now, let me see if I can get a get a view of how that actually anchors. So that is on overhead supports and the overhead supports are 15 feet tall. So they go three feet above the actual top of the greenhouse and that provides a gap between the two. So I've got a three foot gap between the actual shade cloth, which is white and the clear polycarbonate that sits at the top of the greenhouse. I wanted some uh, I wanted some space there because when you leave a little bit of space there, then air can flow through there and keep it nice and cool. I wouldn't want to necessarily set that shade cloth directly on top of this of this structure, although you could. I mean, I don't see a, a huge um, disadvantage of that, except you'd want to make sure you keep the roof tall enough then. If you plan on resting that shade cloth directly on top of the plastic frame, I would say I would want that a minimum of 10 feet, 10, 10 to 12 feet. That way you're keeping the, you're, an air gap between the top of the plants in the greenhouse, 
you, there's a space there then. You always need a space. So it, e it either needs to be on top of this or it needs to be directly below it. So I chose to go a little bit taller on this. Now, uh, we've talked a little bit about the construction. So now let's talk a little bit about the rain harvesting of this structure. So that was another thing that I wanted to keep in mind was I wanted to collect the massive amounts of water that are going to run off of the top of this structure. And of course, where it ties into the roof up here. So this has a pitch on it, like I said, this roof is actually pitched backwards. So it's actually pitched towards the house. Okay, you would normally pitch it away from the house, but the house roof line was not high enough for me to tuck this structure underneath this roof line, the roof line here. I couldn't put this underneath here because I would lose so much height if I brought that out, right? The other problem is that would dump water down into the actual greenhouse where I may or may not want it, okay? So the way I have this designed is it pitches backwards onto the actual roof. Now the roof, I've had this redone in metal in metal also, and it also has a 60 year warranty on it. So I don't foresee any problems with the actual roof the entire rest of my life, right? So the way this works is this drains off of the actual greenhouse. Then the roof actually drains too, because you can see there's a pitch on the roof, right? So the water runs down the greenhouse, drops onto the roof. The water coming from the roof is actually gonna come down also. And then what I've done here is I have put gutters just on the inside here so that I can collect all that extra water, which will now flow down through these these downspouts right here. I've got one there and I've got one over here. Sorry about the lighting guys, it really messes up the picture. Uh, filtered lighting, <laughs> it's really actually wonderful but it's very hard to film in. Okay, so there's another downspout right here. So that will go down to a rain barrel which will be seated underneath this one. And then over here on this side, the same thing, this will have a rain barrel underneath to collect any extra water. This will be a 50 gallon barrel and a 50 gallon barrel. That'll give me a hundred gallons. Then that way I can pump out water in the, in the interims between rains and I can actually put that rain water back on to the plants. So this has been thought out quite, well, quite well and it's got a concrete floor. So this is the old garage floor. It had an epoxy coating on it at one time, but me living here and kind of dragging pots around. I've sort of screwed up the, the epoxy coating, but I really don't care because like I said, this is a place for me to get away in the winter and the summer to propagate plants. Okay. So we've gone over a little bit of the construction of the greenhouse. We've gone over the what, <laughs> Uh, we've gone over a little bit of rain collection and why this is very, very important here for Phoenix, Arizona. So not only is this my greenhouse, but it's rainwater collection. Okay, now we're going to go over some of the systems in which this works to kind of keep these plants going. Okay, so heating. Let's talk about number one. Let's talk about heating. How would you heat a greenhouse like this and is it necessary to heat a greenhouse like this? And I'll tell you the answer in Phoenix anyway is probably no. So I did not heat this greenhouse at all whatsoever this summer. Now, or I'm sorry, this winter. Now what you could do is if you really felt like it, I suppose you could stick a little, a little space heater in here and it would definitely keep it warm. You could probably keep it around 80 degrees in here in the winter time at night if you wanted to. Um, I just kind of watched the temperatures. I've got a a temperature gauge here hooked up to the swamp cooler, which we will talk about here in just a moment. And that kind of tracks my temperatures out here and lets me know if it's getting too cold. So this winter with no supplemental heat at all whatsoever, the lowest that it dipped here in the greenhouse was 60 degrees, okay? 
and that's nice. That's a nice temperature for a nighttime temperature. And so I am more than satisfied with that. And um, I don't see myself using any supplemental heat. It is also happens to be tucked up right next to the house. So it uses literally two walls of the house to keep itself warm. Plus it's got a lid over it, like I said, and there's it's completely still in here, um, even if it's really windy outside. So you definitely take off that that cold chill factor, okay? All right, now let's talk about cooling. So how do we keep this darn thing cool? Because it's going to get hot in here. And in fact, today, if we go over and look at our temperature here, if I can get over here, we are sitting at 98 degrees. So we're right about 100 degrees in here today. And I think our, our high is gonna be around 85 this to refocus there we go I think our high is gonna be around 85 so it does boost the temperature in here now how can you control those temperatures if it's gonna to get too hot and in, in too small of a spot because it's easier to regulate larger greenhouses than it is a smaller greenhouse because a smaller greenhouse is going to heat up and it's gonna cool down faster than something that's larger well there are several ways I can do it one being the first the first line of defense here is the actual vents. So there are vents at the top of the door right there where that gap is right there. And that's because of the, the way the doors open inwards, they need to be angled like that in order to actually sit inside of a pitched roof. So they had to be angled. Well, that made that actually kind of perfect because now I've got a slit right there at the top and if you look over here where it meets the roof, I've got another slit here. And what that does is that hot air kind of stays up there at the top and it, it's cool air is being blown in through one side, through the side over here where it's near the food forest. And then it blows out on the other side, the back side here to keep it, keep it circulating, I guess. Uh, the next thing that you can do is if it's starting to get a little bit hot in here is you can start to open the doors. So if you open the doors on this, you are going to, you're going to cool this at least 10 degrees just by automatically just opening the door. So you can have these cracked open if you want to, and you can sort of watch the temperatures and make sure that they are doing exactly what you want them to do. Okay. So then what's the next way to do it? What happens if doors open and, all this stuff doesn't cool down the greenhouse. Well, then we've got our, our third line of defense here, uh, which is this swamp cooler. So I put in this fairly good sized master cool uh, swamp cooler. And what I did was I built a stand for it that actually sits on the outside of the greenhouse. And then it is cut through with a vent. You can see the vent is right there um, about mid-level, about my level. So when the air comes in nice and cool, it pushes and forces all the hot air out through that top vent and through the vent above the door, which regulates it and keeps it nice and cool in here. Now, let me go around here to the side so you can see. Look at that beautiful variegated guava. Man, that's nice. Let's go around here to the side so you can actually see it. So this is tucked in the back here and this was also thought out placement on this swamp cooler because you want to keep the heat off of the actual swamp cooler so it'll do its job so it is back here in the food forest i mean it is buried back in here with uh, well mainly mangoes there's a whole bunch of giant mango trees back here now some of them are getting really tall and so it's also tucked underneath this mexican cream guava that that is a huge shade tree above it. So it is kept nice and cool down here on the side. And it's also this type of swamp cooler where it's got the cooling, the big cooling pads here that you don't really have to replace. If you wanna know exactly what this is, there it is. This one is hooked up on 220, 220 volts so that it uses basically no electricity at all whatsoever. And what's nice about this particular swamp cooler or this brand or this way of doing it is that you can, you can temperature control it. So you can actually hook it to a thermostat 
and let it auto regulate the temperature for you. So if we come back in here, I'll show you that switch again, which is also made by Master Cool. And it allows you to set a temperature, a said temperature, and it will maintain that exact temperature that you're wanting. So my all my controls are out here, done really well. And it is ran so good back there. And then it's set up to a controller to actually control the, the speed and the temperature of the swamp cooler. So now I can not only cool it in here, but I can raise the relative humidity in here to almost whatever I want it to be. That is the most important thing in Arizona, and it's the one thing nobody thinks about. Everybody thinks about their water and their shade and their mulch and everything else, but nobody thinks about humidity. And humidity is the reason for your microclimate, and humidity is the reason we do a microclimate. And without that extra humidity, you're not going to have very good success with some of these plants. You need to boost that in your yard because most tropical trees, especially really do well off of that humidity factor. The other trees, apples, peaches, things like that, they actually don't like humidity and it will give them fungal diseases on their leaves, whereas most tropicals, they like the humidity to be a little bit higher. Okay, so we've gone over heating, we've gone over cooling, <clears throat> we've gone over humidity, we've gone over shade and how to regulate the shade uh, to get your temperature. So let's go over watering real quick because this is also fully automated and what i have here is i've got a a control box for my irrigation which runs to some valves that are over here and that is activated in just the greenhouse so the greenhouse has its own watering system basically and it is a basically these lines these polytube lines and then i've got these uh, drip emitters these spot emitters so that when I've got plants in here, I can plug them into water easily if I need to by just putting these in. And then if I, if I want to change a plant or sell a plant, I can take these out, put a new plant in, put the new spigot right back in, and I'm off to the races. This greenhouse or this setup will water quite a few plants, actually. I've lost no pressure on just the few that I've got in here, and I've actually got quite a few in here. But I wanted to show you guys this greenhouse while it was gutted before I start to fill it up with all my propagation uh, materials. Just wanted to, guys to show you the, the sort of open floor plan so that you can get an idea of what you're working with here. And it's about a, this one. This one in particular is about a two-car garage. So that's plenty of room for most people, guys. Imagine being able to grow stuff all year long in here. Like one thing I'm definitely putting in here is tomatoes because I want to grow tomatoes yearly, year long. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by keeping the temperature under about 90 degrees so that they will set their fruits. So, um, so yeah, gone over a little bit of the construction. I've gone over, um, how it is controlled. I think I covered everything. I probably missed something. Uh, but yeah, heating, cooling, humidity, shade, watering, and now let's go over the types of plants. So what do I plan on putting in here? Or what do I plan on, on growing in this greenhouse? Well, I plan on growing a lot of the stuff that I want to propagate and graft, like I was telling you before, or stuff that I want to air layer, things that I have very odd plants of. So like this, uh, this variegated guava. This is more of a sensitive plant because you've got a lot of this white in the leaves. So a plant like this is gonna benefit from being in a greenhouse like this, and then I can air layer it and make more plants. But I wanted to kind of show you guys the quality, just the quality of the plants that are in here and have been in here all winter long because these things are absolutely perfect. I have, <laughs> I have never seen such perfect trees and these are all seedlings. So I'm going to grow all these from seed. Like I said before, this is a mango. Look at this thing. It's just absolutely perfect. And then I will graft on varieties 
out of the yard that had already been here for quite some time. So that's the best way you're going to get a locally grown, locally grafted mango tree. And like I said, these look beautiful for especially seedlings to have gone through the winter. And you can see that they are getting, they are getting their new flushes. And man, do I have a lot of these. I have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. This was a project that I started last year. So I do have quite a few of these guys growing. This is just a very small, small sample. They're, they're everywhere. Another good example is ice cream beans. So that's another one that I like to grow locally because I've got the fruit that I can take the seeds out of to grow the trees. But look at the quality of these plants. Like these things are just amazing. Perfect condition, growing, got their new flushes of growth on them. And they just look stunning. So my goal here to, is to have very high quality, locally grown plants. Man, these ice cream beans are just charging. Look at this one. Just absolutely beautiful. And then I can air layer some really, really rare plants that I have that are super delicious, like this guava. This is an excellent white guava. So I kind of stuck him in here to hide him, and I will do some air layers off of a lot of these uh, plants. So it's going to be a lot of beautiful plants. I mean, look at these. These are those are five gallon, five gallon pots. You can see the size and the vigor of these trees when they're locally grown here they're just absolutely stunning so what else do we have here i'm just going to show you sort of a small sampling of things and then i'll do another video where i kind of come out here and fill fill the greenhouse and then so what are these so these are spanish limes these are actually my favorite fruit on the entire planet if i had to just pick one fruit and nobody's ever heard of this fruit <laughs> if you're from puerto rico maybe you've heard of this fruit but it is just the best, best fruit tree on the actual planet. So let me dig one of these out of here so you guys can see the, the size and vigor on these. And you can kind of see the roots, the roots growing out the bottom here. So you know that these things are, are beautiful quality. So look at this. As big as the mango, if we put it up here on the... On the same size and look at the quality of these plants guys especially a, a fruit tree like this this is one of the rarest fruit trees on the planet and I've got hundreds of these this I have really kind of doubled down on the the Spanish limes or canipas if you're more familiar with that name uh, so I've got these by the hundreds I've got mangoes by the hundreds just beautiful plants. Look at this quality plant. Now, imagine if I got to the point where I can send these, then I can ship something like this and you will get a beautiful plant in the mail. And if you know from mail, mail ordering plants, you know that you don't get a very big plant for the price. Most people, when you order a plant online, they'll be about this big. They'll have usually one or two or four leaves on them, and they're about 40 to 50 bucks. So when you get that plant in the mail, you're a little bummed out because you're like, man, I, it would have been nice to have something a little, more, a little more substantial. Now imagine getting something like this in the mail where you've got this beautiful rare tree that's growing beautifully and is the same price as the trees that you used to buy as very very small trees so mangoes for sure Spanish limes for sure let's see what else what else do we have here well mangoes everywhere uh, jackfruits so let's talk about locally grown jackfruits because these things are absolutely stunning let's dig one of these out of here too I mean, imagine getting one of these in the mail. Let's take him over with the over with the Spanish lime. So look at the size of the of the leaves. First of all, on this plant, huge, huge, huge leaves. So as comparison to the to the Spanish lime there and the mangoes, 
I mean, I would be absolutely thrilled if I got something like this in the mail. I have ordered things in the mail before and I've been sorely disappointed. But imagine having something like this that will actually survive and fruit in Arizona, whereas most people can't even keep jackfruits alive because they're brought in from Florida. And when they're brought in from Florida, they are used to the humidity in Florida and they do not do well here in Arizona. So we've got thousands of trees. I don't even know what all, <laughs> what all I've got anymore. So tons of mangoes, of course, Spanish limes, jackfruits, lychees, um, and then of course all the, all the hardier plants. Got tons of those also. Here is an example of some figs. Uh, these figs happen to be uh, Nixon Peace figs. This is a pretty rare, pretty rare fig, a China honey fig. And same thing, I mean, you're going to be getting a, a really good quality plant, especially if you pick it up here locally. And eventually, like I said, I want to send these, I want to be able to send these in the mail. Because now you can get a nice, beautiful little, little fig tree like this. And if you don't think he's rooted, if you'll look here to the sides, you'll see the roots pouring out of the sides of this plant already. You guys see them? So imagine being able to get a fully rooted plant like this in the mail that is guaranteed to grow, especially in a hot climate and is a very rare um, a rare species of tree. Like this one's a, the Nixon Peace Fig. You don't see too many of these around. Now imagine being able to get anything you want like this, basically. So like for instance on figs, you know, I've got tons of Tiger Panache, the Strawberry Jam Figs. That's a lot of people's favorites. Uh, we've got the Nixon Peace Figs. We've got White Marsai Figs. We've got Kadota figs, brown turkey figs, black mission figs, atlas figs, um, magnolia figs, ruby figs. Uh, the list goes on, on and on and on and on. Got hundreds of these things that are ready to go for this year. And something like this could be planted or it could definitely be up potted into something else and it will grow very quickly. You can see that we've already got this amount of growth out of a cutting right in less than a month so we've got the uh we definitely have the propagation game nailed here and i'm gonna start just pumping out pumping out the trees so we've got about right around five thousand to kind of start the year here with and then we've got many 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 more growing and eventually i would like to start mail order sending some of these plants off if anyone's interested so definitely if you've never commented on a video put a comment down in the bottom if you would like to get a hold of some of these plants especially mail order because that's something that i'm working on and if you're interested in that let me know if nobody's interested i'm obviously just going to sell them here locally i won't don't need to do anything mail order but i did like i said i wanted to expand um, onto some larger projects. So that's what we've been working on this this winter guys So I know you guys haven't had a video from me in a while and that's because I have been busy 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 bringing you guys some of the best Quality fruit trees that you can get your hands on because believe me I'm obsessed with this and I am really into growing these quality trees. Okay, so if you have not subscribed, please subscribe. I know this was a longer video, and if you made it to the end of this video, fantastic. You are a trooper and you have patience, which means you'll do good at gardening. Other Those other people that are not patient, they've obviously shut the video off before now, and they're not going to do well in the gardening world, okay? Because you need patience, 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 patience. So, all right, guys, uh, that is about it for today. I'm going to wrap this one up. This one's going on about an hour long, which is very long for my videos. I usually don't do them that long, but I wanted to go over some of the things that I've been working on and will be bringing you this year and the years to come. 
and we've got our food park started so that is going to be hopefully available in a few years also and it is oh my gosh you guys the plans that are coming the plans that are coming and the expansion so yeah we plan on having tons and tons of fruit trees for you guys available and always new stuff it's not going to be the same old boring stuff over and over because i get bored of things and i kind of move on to other things as we go here but like i said i wanted to do this video to kind of catch you guys up and i'll be doing some more here as spring has begun i don't do a lot during the winter and i don't do a lot during the summer as far as videos go because those are my busiest seasons those are actually when i'm doing my work on the nursery and improvements and going out finding cool varieties of, of different fruit trees and doing my research that's what i'm doing during those time periods so i'm not a whole lot on social media anymore and that's just due to the time constraints and the things that that i have been working on and trying to bring you guys um i did want to go over a couple other other plants over here too because this is a really good place for jabo takaba if you guys are wanting to grow Jabotacaba, which I know a lot of people struggle struggle with that plant, they do excellent in an environment like this. I've got two sitting here right next to each other. Beautiful Jabos. You guys know how hard these are here in Arizona, and they're getting up to the to the to my roof line, so they're getting quite a bit taller now. And man, they just look killer out here. Their new foliage is beautiful, and they actually grow very quickly. It's the environments that you're giving them that they don't grow quickly. So these have been growing for about a week and they've grown way over a foot. So Jabo Takaba is also possible here in Phoenix, Arizona, but you got to give it just the right climate. And just by seeing these couple plants, you know that we've got this microclimate thing nailed because Jabo Takaba is probably the, one of the hardest, slowest growing plants here in Phoenix, Arizona, period. Just period, but look at the amazing amount of new growth that are on these plants because they're locally grown. <laughs> Suriname cherries, just love it in this environment. Just growing, everything's growing, nothing's, nothing's died. So yeah, proof of concept is definitely there. So our next one, which we're working on right now, is going to be about four times the size of this greenhouse. It's not going to be here. It's going to be on our other property and we'll be able to do a lot more propagation. All right, guys, that is it. I am done talking and I am going to get back to my plants, but I just wanted to show you guys a couple samples of what's going on in here before I fill it. And this will eventually be full of all of these type of plants that will be available for people as they come. And then as they get adapted to this environment and grow to a certain size, once they hit about two to three feet, then they're going to go out into the yard. So they're going to get, they're going to get acclimated. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing this thing anymore. All right, guys. So I will leave you with this beautiful, uh, spicy nectar plum because the leaves are just amazing on this plant. They are a dark purple, dark burgundy as compared to the other leaves in the yard so this one always tells me that spring is here all right guys please subscribe throw a little like on there throw some comments down on the bottom this is an important one because this this is what boosts me and keeps me going as far as like my business ideas um i don't i don't need the uh the fame of the the likes and the comments but what it does is it helps me generate what i'm going to do for you guys for the next season or the years to come. So definitely hit a like, subscribe, and put some comments down in the bottom. All right, guys, long enough. Have a good evening.